Hello and welcome to Raw the Fight Within podcast with myself, Coog and Cassius. This week I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a long-time friend of, uh, of myself and also IFL TV, uh, Mr Two Tanks himself, O'Hara Davies. How are you, mate, first of all? I'm good. Um, it's good to be here. Good to be here. I've known you for about 10 years now, haven't I? It has been I about think, 10 years. I think years. we've done our first interview, I think it was 2013, me, you and James Argent in Essex Fight Academy. I don't know if you remember it. Yes, I do remember it, yeah. Years ago. I do remember it. It was through James Argent, who's, I and mean, we'll talk about James uh, later on, but he was, um, I think he was quite pivotal around that time to how, yeah, we were kind of all introduced to each other, so, yeah. yeah. Such a long time. Right, let's um, start kind of easy-ish, possibly. Currently today, O'Hara, if you could change one thing about your life, your current life, what would you change? If I could change one thing about my current life, what a question. Mm. Uh, probably nothing. You wouldn't change anything? If I could change some of the mistakes I've made in the past, yeah. That's a different question, but just right now, for how your life is right now. There's nothing I change. I there's nothing you change? I, I absolutely love my life. I love it. There's, nothing, there's, there's, actually, there's actually nothing I would change. Nothing at all. No? You could have more money, could have more uh, whatever thing. I could, have, I could say that, yes, but then that would take away my goals and my dream and the work ethic. I like to work for what I've got. And, you know, sometimes I feel like it's, good, it's a good thing, the fact that I'm not rich, because if I was, if I was rich, it would probably take away from my, from my ambition and from me wanting to be world champion, you know. Obviously, I want to achieve in this game, boxing, but then the financial aspect is also, it plays a massive part in me wanting to be successful in what I do too. So if I'm already rich, then it's already like taken away one of the, um, one of the reasons that I want to be so successful. So I like my life how it is. I'm not rich, I'm okay, I'm comfortable, and I'm working to be rich one day. So it's just... I'd I kind of really like that answer because you obviously haven't thought about it, but your yeah. kind of your explaining of it and yeah. the context behind it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> mo, mo money, my problems, isn't it? That's it. Apparently, That's it. Um, but this is going to be possibly difficult for you to answer. But I do like kind of, especially with boxers, their mindset of how if if you hadn't got into the whole boxing of biz, uh, business of boxing, excuse me. What, what do you think right now you'd be doing? Or what do you like to have thought that you'd be doing right now in your life at 31? I'd probably be sat in a cell. Do you mean that? Yeah. Before I got into boxing, I wasn't doing anything good. I was only a kid. I got kicked out of every school that I've ever been to. My primary school I got kicked out from. My first secondary school I got kicked out from. My second one I got kicked out from. Academically, I wasn't the smartest kid in the you know, I wasn't, the, I wasn't the smartest kid in my school. Math, English and science wasn't my thing. And I grew up being told and thinking that if you don't achieve in math, English and science and in those, you know, subjects there, you're not anything in life, you're not going to become successful. And boxing something that I found in a youth club. In a youth club. So if I wasn't boxing, you know, I probably, I probably would have still been on the block doing drugs, having gang fights, and I probably would have done something really bad and ended up in jail. Just like some of my friends are. I've got many friends that are in jail because they because then I was on the same path as them, but I got off the path and they didn't get off that path. And today they're in jail and I believe I would have followed that same road. Mm. And that's a bit of an old... And, and people say it's like the whole cliche thing, if I, you know, boxing. But it, it is so true amongst quite a lot of people in it has kind of deterred them away from um, whether it's you know, that life on the street or whatever it is. It has, that's not a, like a cliche thing. I look at it as I've heard multiple stories over the years. You know loads of people that generally without um, the emphasis of boxing in their life, their life could have been dramatically um, taken a different course. Most of us fighters come from hard times and a lot of, a lot of fighters come from the hood. But what I say is in a hood is they got so much untapped potential. I think there's a quote I saw by Jay-Z. In a hood they got so much untapped potential. 
and what they need to do, they need to bring more opportunities into the hood so that the people in the hood can see what they're good at. Not everyone's good at maths, English and science. Someone might be good at football, someone might be good at basketball, someone might be good at music, on the pianos, on the drums. So what they need to do, they need to bring all of these opportunities there so that everyone can find their thing because boxing isn't everyone's thing. Boxing it was my thing, mm -hmm. but in that youth club, I wasn't the only one there. That was, there was probably 30 to 40 of us and the boxing coach came in and everyone gave it a go. The only one that went back every week was me. But the other person probably would have been good at, I don't know, I don't know, who knows, tennis, basketball. But because there wasn't a tennis coach there or a basketball coach there, today that guy's in jail. Because just because he didn't have that opportunity. And I'm just very blessed and I'm thankful that, you know, I found my thing. But, I mean, listen, it wasn't, when I look at you, I don't just strictly look at opportunities at some point. But you've had to, you've had to graft for that opportunity. You've had to... Be persistent. It hasn't always gone your way in your mm. career in terms of, um, you know, you've done kind of the complete circuit when at points in your life, maybe you should have been further than where you are, but mm. you've stuck at it, you've mm. kept at it, you've put in the graft and mm. yes, you've rubbed a few people up the wrong way and yes, you've maybe moaned about it a little bit on the way, but regardless of whatever, I don't think anyone can take it away from the fact that you have put yourself mm -hmm. in this position that you're in? Yeah, I have. You know what? My boxing career has been so up and down, Cuban. So, so up and down. I've been a pro almost coming up to 10 years now. And there's been many points where I got written off. You know, at the start, everyone said, oh, D's the man, going to become world champion, blah, blah, blah. I was the man. My phone used to ring a hell of a lot of times a day. And then I fought Taylor, and then I took my first loss. And then, you know, the Catterwell fight where I believe I won the fight, but then on paper it's a loss. And um, a lot of people, they wrote me off. And, you know, people online writing comments about me. I used to see all of these stuff, but I said, you know what, it's fine. Just keep on working. Talent's one thing that they can't deny. Um, you know, a lot of it has been my fault as well. You know, the way I've acted online, the things that I've said, the persona, the character that I've tried to play, that just isn't me. You know, it was fake. It was it was fake, and I feel like that's probably a part of the reason why things didn't really go my way. But now, I, you know, I'm just being me, thankful, happy, not arrogant, focused on my training, with my fights, and and you know what, that's it. And opportunities have now come my way. Um, I've seen many people come and go in my time as a pro. I've seen many. I've seen many people come and go. I've seen bad luck fall upon so many others and I'm just very blessed and I'm thankful to still be fighting today. What was your childhood actually like? Was you getting into scraps when you was a kid? I'm talking about like a young kid. Uh, not scraps. We don't really fight. It's you more use a knife or you get a weapon. We didn't really fight people. You know, it was more, you know, post-Cold Wars. I'm from this area, you're from that area. E9, bang, bang, E5, E8. I'm from you know, you know this area, and it was more like postcode wars, and you don't like that person, or if we see you on the streets, you know it's on. But no one really fought with their hands. It was more used on you know a knife, where you get a weapon and you and you bat someone. Um, that's what my childhood was like, really. School wasn't really a big, you know, it wasn't really a part of it. I, I just went to school because it's what you had to do. But it wasn't a it, uh, it wasn't positive. It's a shame, really, isn't it? Because, like, I know, obviously, London, especially, well, listen, all areas and all major kind of these inner city areas have, have had this problem and they still have it today. What the solution is, who knows? But um, it's, it's difficult if you're kind of born into that or brought up around them situations. It's, it's difficult to get out of it. It's very hard to get out of it. And from you know from the from the gang that I was in, the people that I used to I used to um, I used to be with, there's only a few of us that have managed to get out from that life and to do something positive or to get an actual normal job. It's so hard. It's so hard. Once you get in it, the years just you know the years go on. You get kicked out of school. You start to sell weed. You get arrested for it. You get a criminal record or two. Then it's hard to get a job and it's hard to get off that path and to change your mind. 
it's hard. It's hard. Um, I'm just, you know, if it wasn't for boxing, I'd still be there. Talk to me about a time in your life, uh, and it's something that sticks out to me already um, when I ask this question, but a point in your life where you felt as though you were fighting a losing battle? Mm, a point in my life where I felt like I fight, where I'm fighting a losing battle? There's been so many times in my life where I've been, where I've felt that way. So, so many. Uh, just putting just put me on the spot. I mean, the, the one I was making reference to was obviously from a a few years ago in the kind of the middle of your, your, your boxing career where that felt like you was fighting a losing battle can from I the bring outside. That up? You can talk about it, yeah. When I got thrown under the bus, Keegan, all of those years ago, I was innocent. Listen, I was, on, I was at home, I got a text from the person that I was getting managed by at that time said, send a tweet to this certain boxer so that we can make this fight happen, cause some hype. So what I've done, you know what, I found a reason to send a tweet and then I sent the tweet and then there was a complete uproar. People thinking that I'm talking about the Hillsborough. I had never heard of Hillsborough this time. You know, I had never heard of it. I don't know anything about football. Nothing about football. And, you know, I think it was 96 people that died. And the fact that, you know what, boxing fans and also boxers that knew me came online and they made it seem like as if I'm trying to mock the families of, um, of the 96 people that died. I'm like, for me to mock these people that have died, that means that I'm evil. That means that I'm a very evil person. And these people, they know that, they know that my heart's not like that. I've known them. They see me in the gym. They see me outside the gym. They see me in person. What's going to make you think that I'm going to mock the families of the 96 that died? It's mad. That is that is mad. Even though I was completely I was completely innocent, I looked online every day, every single day, and I'm seeing this and seeing that, seeing the newspapers writing this about me, articles, videos on YouTube about me. I got taken off the boxer show that I was meant to be on. Um, <laughs> that was a very dark point in my boxing career, a very dark point. And you know what? A few months before that, I took my first loss as a pro. So I so I had already taken a hit. So it was like I, so it was like I've already like taken one hit and then bang an even bigger hit and then bang I got taken off a show and that was just mad. So after that, I left my manager, the promoter, the coach. I had to find a whole new team. I had to find I found a new manager, a new promoter, a new coach, all in the space of six months. That was mad. And you know what? If it wasn't I just had to keep. I just had to keep on going. I just had to keep on going. But but that was a very dark point in my boxing career. And there was a few other things in life as well at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look. I, I was obviously. I remember that that situation quite vividly. And you know, look. One thing I will kind of not that. Listen, this is obviously in the past now. But one thing I will say in, in regards to yourself and that situation. Um, is that I, I'm a I'm a huge football fan. Like I'm, I'm probably a bigger football fan than I'm a, a boxing fan, if if truth be told. So I'm aware of kind of all the the context around anything to do with obviously Liverpool and Hillsborough. I'm aware of that because I was I kind of I was young, but I still kind of remember. I know you go on Twitter sometimes and like to wind people up with um, like. You did with um, when you fought Lewis Ritson when you wore the. Uh, what team was it? What I can't think. What you didn't? What did you wear? A Man United shirt because they'd That's beaten yeah. uh, his team. Um, but I know that you're not really a football fan. I, I've never known you to be a football fan. I think when I've read some of your tweets about players and stuff, and I'm thinking, this is someone who. Like, I know, mm. without saying disrespectful, I know that you're not kind of a football fan. So um, it doesn't surprise me to hear that, even though obviously that was a, a tragic, uh, one of the most horrendous things that's ever happened, um, that it doesn't surprise me to know that you didn't know that. I think the naive, naivety comes from writing something that, or making reference without complete context no, behind but it. Also, isn't Tommy Cole, isn't he from Hull? <laughs> so that connection. How yeah. was it made? 
I know that he doesn't like the son because the son exposed him. What uh, the things that he's been doing in his gym. This is why Tommy Cole doesn't like the son. It wasn't because of the hills, bro. So, so that, so even that whole connection, it wasn't valid. Mm -hmm. It wasn't valid. Yes, the hills were something that I didn't know about, but yeah, but still, that argument isn't valid because Tommy Cole is from Hull, and he doesn't like the son for a complete different reason. You know. Anyway. But look, this is in the past now. Like I said to you, you've, you know, you. You know, but I still talk about it today. People say, "Ah." Oh, it's been six years ago. Why are you still talking about it? Get over it. You got thrown under the bus. Yeah, I'm still talking about it. And I will continue talking about it for another 10 years. Do you know why? Because that could have easily been my boxing career done. Easily. Easily. That could have easily been it done. And then, you know what? I got ridiculed by the whole... I got ridiculed by the whole country. So, you know, I was in a dark... I was in a dark point in life and, that's, and that situation put me in that place. So there's no way I three years are going to go by and magically I'm over it. Like, no, no, like, people don't know what that situation put me through and what those people that went online saying bad things about me put me through. You know, I'm never going to get over it. I'm never going to forgive those that, that, um, that made it seem worse than it actually was. Those that started this whole thing. I'm never, I'm never going to forgive them. Currently today, you're in a, a better part of your life right now. What, what are the everyday battles for, for O'Hara? What are they when you wake up in the morning? What are they? The everyday battles for me when I wake up in the morning? I have none, Cleveland. Every day I wake up, I'm ambitious. I feel motivated. I feel very thankful. I feel like it's all about the mindset. I can find stuff to be sad about and unhappy about, but I don't, think, I don't look at anything that way. I'm so thankful right now. Um, this is, and that's the phase of life that I'm in right now. Every single day when I wake up, I'm thankful. I'm happy. I feel blessed. I've got no battles right now. The only battle I've got is against Ismail Broso, December 2nd. Would you call yourself an emotional person? Mm. When's the last time you cried? The last time I cried? I don't remember. I'm not really an emotional person now. I'm not really an emotional person. Um, I don't take anything too, too seriously. Um, I've got a few people, a few close friends, family, people that I love, and the only people that can get me emotional is them. But there's no one else that can really get, you know, there's nothing I see online or something that happens to someone that I don't really care about anyway. I don't really know him that well. So it's nothing that I really care about. Nothing really gets me emotional. Um, actually, no. When I beat Lewis Ritson, I cried. That's the last time I cried because I knew boxing can get me very emotional because I love boxing. Boxing's been my whole life ever, ever since I started it when I was 18 years old. Um, and I knew that if I didn't win that fight, that could have been my boxing career done. That fight was like heaven or hell. The winner would get the world title shot, the loser, where do they go? And look at his boxing career right now. Where does he go? Look at my boxing career now. I've got the world title shot next. And I knew what that fight meant. It's either heaven or hell, everything or nothing. And that's why I cried after the fight. Apart from boxing and my, and my family, no one else can make me cry. Yeah, I do, I do remember um, around that fight time. I mean, you, you was emotional because you are right. It was kind of make or break for, for you and Ritson mm. at the time. So... Um, yeah, I can see how boxing would make you uh, one of the two things that obviously your family aside would be the thing to make you emotional. Um, do you believe at any point in your life that boxing has caused any spates of depression in your life? Oh, hell no. Of course not. If it wasn't for boxing, I'd probably be depressed. Because, you know, um, I've, always felt, I've always felt quite lonely ever since I was young. Even when I started boxing, the, you know, when I was living at Mum's house, there's a field not far from there. I used to go every day, every other day, go to the field, take a walk in the field and just look at the green grass, the green grass and look at the people playing football and just sit down and be lonely. I've always felt alone. And it's not depressed. I wasn't depressed. I just felt very lonely. And now because of boxing, it's, 
I feel positive every day. I feel positive. I never feel that way no more. I'm not lonely. I'm not. I live on my own. I, I live. I, I live at home. I live on my own, and I absolutely. I love it. I love being on my own. I love being in my own space. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting you say that. You're, you're the first person I've asked that question to on now. Where you, you've said that if it wasn't for boxing, I would be depressed. Because at some point, I think a lot of fighters I've, in, I've, I've asked this question to, they've said that they've gone through it at some, some points. They've not realised they've gone through it until after, etc. But you're the first person to say, no, actually, if it wasn't for boxing, you would be, or you even, could have gone through that. Even at the times... Even at the times where my boxing career wasn't really going that well and everyone everyone thought I was done, people used to write me off, it was only motivation. I used to see these things online, I used to be like, yeah, I'm going to work harder, I'm going to get there one day. It's only motivation. Even when I got thrown under the bus, it's only motivation because I knew that I was innocent. I was a bit angry, yes, but I wasn't depressed because it's only motivation. I've, only, I've got something to prove to the world and to myself. I can never be depressed when I've got boxing in my life. Never. Mm. Never, ever. If you, I'm not asking for like a regret here, but if you could go back in your life and handle any situation, one situation differently, is there one situation you may have handled differently? Obviously, there's the obvious one that you, you spoke about there, but was there anything else you'd go back in your life to have uh, dealt with differently? No, because everything that I've done is what's made me uh, this person that I am now and listen <laughs> I can say I can give you a certain I can give you one but then that's something that I wouldn't change because then that's the mistake that I made then but if I didn't make it then I would have made it now or I'd have made it at a later time in life but after I fought Taylor I've seen this girl listen crazy girl the girl that keyed my car. Do you remember that? I remember that. You, you spoke about it on an IFO interview. Car, she came and popped my car tyres and she broke the windshield mirrors and she and she damaged the car. It cost me a hell of a lot of money to fix. And I remember after fighting Taylor, I got my first paycheck, big paycheck. If, what did I do? I took her out to New York and to Miami. For 10 days, I spent 10K. I spent £10,000. I remember and this. And you know what? The worst thing is at this time, I was still living at my mum's house. I was, I, I was still living at mum's house. And I wasted money, and you know what? I would have spent more money. But then, Coogan, if this is not a mistake I would have made back then, it's a mistake I would have made now when I've earned more money. And I would have made that same, that same mistake, I would have made it on a bigger scale. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have spent 10k, I would have spent 50k, 100k. So I'm glad that I made that certain mistake then, because now I look at it now and I'm like, someone's lucky if I spent 100 pounds on them. <laughs> you know, now I've got the mindset where I think about, is about investing. If I've got 10K, I need to invest that 10K, not go out on a holiday spending it on girls. So that's a mistake I had to make because now I've learned from it. So so that is one situation you would have handled differently, possibly. It's, it's a situation I would, I would have handled differently having the same mindset that I had now. Yeah. But that situation gave me the mindset I, had, I have now. So Swings and roundabouts. Yeah. Who's been the biggest influence on your life? The biggest influence on my life? Probably my Older, my oldest brother, William, he's been the biggest influence in my life. Um, Why? Pardon? Why? Because um, he's been the biggest influence in my life because he's the one that really got me into investing. You know, we all know that I'm big and I'm really big in investing into property, Bitcoin, crypto or whatever. Anything that's got the word investing involved with it, I'm interested in it. And um, I remember when, um, after, I, after I come back from... New York, after I took that burn and I spent 10K in 10 days, I still had a bit of money in the bank. So I remember being in my bedroom at mum's house and then um, I was on the phone to the car, to some car shop. I, f I forgot what shop it was, but I wanted to get the BMW i8. You know the BMW i8? It's like the Lamborghini, the doors go up. Yeah. The side. Lovely car. I still want the car, but I still ain't got it. And then um, he was in the room next door and he said to me, you're going to go get a car like that and you're going to park it where? I said, mum's house. He said to me, by tomorrow, that car will be gone. Don't forget, it's not like you're living in a rich part of town. Yeah. And then, he, then a few days later, he said to me, you know, why don't you go and get your own flat and park the car in your own driveway? And then a few days later, he said to me, you know what, if you want to get a flat, I'll go hard for you. Even though I had the money to get my own flat, just 
Yeah, so after he said that, I thought, you know what, I could use my, my own money, but I'd rather use half, I'd, I'd rather just use half mine and half his, then I've got, I've got a bit more money that I can spend. Mm -hmm. And then we started to invest. And then, you know what, I thought, I thought after that, I've got a bit of money. I said, yeah, now I'm going to get that car. But then I sat down and I thought to myself, because of what he said, I thought, but if we get another flat, that means I'll be, that means I'll be able to put this one on rent and get the rental income, so then I'll be making money. But if I get the car now, I've got to spend new tyres, I have to service it, petrol, I have to do the MRT, all of these things. I can either spend money or I can make money. I said, OK, cool, let's get one more flat. And ever since then, every time I find I get money, I keep on buying the flats now. And, you know, this is, this is what's going to really set me up for life. So in that sense, my older brother's been the biggest influence. Mm -hmm. Difficult one, this next one. Might take a bit of thinking, but if you want to come back to it before we finish, then you can. What song best explains O'Hara Davis' life? What song best explains my life? Yeah. What song explains your life? Not to the exact, but just... Some people have got this in there straight away, and other people thinking, hang on a minute, let me have a think about this. Probably 50 Cent Changes. Yeah. Changes. He's got a song, Changes, where he just talked about the way life can change, the way that people change on you, people that love you one day and then the next day they completely hate you. Um, just that kind of stuff. The 50 Cent one or the two pack one? 50 Cent one. 50 Cent one. Yeah, I know two pack's got one, but. I'm not sure I've heard the 50. I, don't, I can't think. Yeah. Do you want to rap it now? No, no, no. I'm not really good at rapping. But that's that that about. explains your life to a certain degree? That explains my life to a certain degree. Anytime that, that I hear that song, I resonate with all the words that he speaks, with all the lyrics. I'm like, wow. Yeah, because it's something that he's gone through and something that I haven't gone through to that same extent yet. But with more success that will come, I will go through that on a bigger scale. And um, yeah, it's true. You know, people do, people do change on you. And it's something you have to grow and be ready for. You have to understand and be and be ready for it. People, I know some people that have already that have already changed on me, but I know that there's even more to come. And when it happens, I won't be surprised because it's something that I'm expecting. Because everyone else that's gone through the path that I'm looking to go through has already experienced that. So I know that ultimately, if I get where I'm supposed to get to, I'm going to go through it too. You're 31 now. Mm -hmm. If I could take you back 10 years to go and give a little bit of advice to a 21-year-old OD, what would you say? Be focused for all your camps. Don't overlook anyone. Don't spend too much money on women. Uh, Don't spend too much money on women, no? Don't spend too much money on women. I've made a hell of a lot of mistakes. Definitely you? not that 10k in 10 days, that's wild. Yeah, listen, that's wild, but even before that, I was going out of um, different hotels, different restaurants. We was booking a hotel every week, and not just a normal hotel, like one of the expensive hotels in central London. Every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm like, I'm still living at Mummy's house. All this money that I spent, I could have bought a few properties. Even though I'm doing okay now, me and my brother, we've got a few now, I could be doing a lot more. If I was that bit smarter, but... Do you, not, not, do you not look at it as all part of the process as well? It's all part of the learning process, but then I think about it. If I didn't make those certain mistakes and I had the mindset that I had now, back then, I'd be a lot further now. I'd be a lot further now, but it's okay. It's okay. Are you happy? I'm very happy, Kevin. Oh, hell yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Even when I'm not happy, I'm still happy. Because when I'm not happy, that's based on a certain situation that's made me feel a certain way. But in the long run, overall, I'm very happy. And I think I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. That's a really encouraging and positive uh, mindset. And it's good to hear you talk like this. Because I do. What I've been doing. I've been doing ice baths. <laughs> Every, like, three times a week I've been doing ice baths and it's really changed my whole life. You it's just changed. come out of one when I, I met you here today. Yeah, I'm still shivering now a little bit. It's changed my life, dude, and it's changed my mindset. It makes me, I feel more positive. I sleep a lot better every night before I used to have a few sleeping problems. Um, 
yeah, if you do your research as to what ice baths do, it's good for the mind and the body. It's good. It's just good for you as a whole, overall. And ever since I've been doing it, it's an addiction. It's an it's an addiction. Um, you know, some people that get addicted to drugs, to weed, or to cocaine because you know it because it can release certain chemicals in the brain. But the ice bath does the same thing on a bigger scale, and it's good for you. I'm addicted to it, and I, I I only wish that I've been I wish I, I wish that I've been doing it for years. I've only been doing it for a couple of months now, but if I knew about this a couple of years ago, I would have been doing this a couple of years ago. You're definitely controversial, but would you call yourself misunderstood? Misunderstood, yes, but my fault. It's my fault I'm being misunderstood because I'm one way in person, but then I've been a different way online, mm. and and even certain people that I meet now, they. Uh, they still judge me on that online persona that they've known of me all of those years ago. And then they see me, they sit down on me and and we speak and then they say to me, oh, you know, I think you're actually okay. And it's like, I, f I thought you was a bit different, you know. I had, a certain idea, I had a certain idea of you. So I'm definitely misunderstood, but it's been self-inflicted, you know. I won't blame anyone for that, but myself. And that's, and that's, the, mistake, that's the mistake that I made for listening to certain people that encourage me to be a certain person and to, uh, to play a certain role. And these people, they didn't care about me. If they really loved me for me, or if they really loved me, or if they, not even love, if they really cared about me as a person, they wouldn't have encouraged me to play a certain role, a certain role, but it's okay. Yeah, it's interesting, because if, if I'd never met you and I just judged you from your Twitter, mm. I'd probably have a different opinion about you, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, because mm -hmm. I've known you and like whenever I've spoken to anyone about you, my yeah. always thing is like, like OD's all right. It's mm -hmm. just don't go by that Twitter stuff. That's mm -hmm. all a bit of a, mm -hmm. a pantomime, a bit mm -hmm. of a, you know, mm -hmm. selling fights and all that. That kind of his pers personality mm -hmm. in regards to that wouldn't take him judge on that. But if all people read is your Twitter mm -hmm. or your kind of things sometimes you said in interviews, etc., which has got a lot better over the years, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but if they're just going by that, then their opinion is being formed solely on that, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, as I said, it's been self-inflicted. It's been my fault. I've said certain things in my interviews. I've been acting a certain way online. That just isn't me. I'm still learning. You know, sometimes I still say things, but I don't go past, a, I don't go over the edge as I used to. So now I've learned to I've learned to handle it a bit more. Whereas also at the start I was so wow over the online stuff. Wow, I've got the blue tick, wow, I've got followers, wow, people know me. And I got so excited about it when I should have just chilled, relax, relax, be you. But I got so excited about it, I'm like I never experienced this in my life. And this is a little kid off the block, I'm from Hackney, that grew up doing drugs and getting in gang violence and now Damn, I'm a star, people know me. Now, I didn't know how to handle it. But as the years have gone by, as the years have gone by, I've gotten more used to it. I've learned, just be yourself. Mm. Okay, last one. What drives that fight within you? What is it? When you get up, what are the factors that drive that fight within O'Hara Davis? Two things. Hit me. Making money, yep. becoming world champion. Becoming world champion is something that I owe myself. I owe myself this because this is what I dreamed of when I first got into boxing. I used to lay down at, in bed at night. Every night it used to take me f two, three hours until I fully fall asleep. Why? Because I used to envision me in a big fight. I get caught and then I catch him and there's a competitive fight and then I knock him out. And yeah, oh, how are they? This is the world champion. I envisioned this night after night after night for years. For years. And I feel like I owe it to my... I owe it to my younger self. I feel like now as I've gotten older, my priorities in life are now different. Now my mindset is more like setting myself up for life, becoming successful, taking care of me and my family. These things have they have ultimately become more important than me being successful in boxing, becoming a world champion. So but I feel like I owe it to my younger self because this is what he this is what he dreamed of all of those years ago. And I feel like I, I feel like I owe this to him, and I want to become rich and successful. Once I've done, once I've done that, I've got to find a new drive, Ruben. I kind of like that. Kind of like that. 
Um, okay, OD, listen, appreciate you coming on this. Um, wanna, not 100% sure when this is going out, but we do know it will be out before um, your fight on December 2nd. So, yeah, just the, the final word on that. Obviously, you're, you're, you're deep in camp um, as we speak. And, yeah, huge opportunity for you um, against Barossa, mm -hmm. um, who UK fans will be very aware of, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, um, you've got a, a job to do in America, and uh, let's hope you can do it. I believe I will. I've been working very hard. This, um, I've, been, I've, been working, I've been working very hard for this camp, harder than I've worked in my last camp, the camps even before that. This has been the hardest camp I've had, but it's been the best camp I've had. Um, I'm fast, I'm sharp. My sparring's all good, and I'm leaving no stones unturned. I believe I'm going to win this fight. I should win this fight. If I don't win the fight, it was God's will. Because I've done everything in my power to make this camp go good and to win this fight, to be in the best shape that I can. If I don't win this fight, it was out of my control. It's God's will. OD, the best of luck. Guys, thank you very much for... Listening or watching, uh, we will see you next week or you'll see us rather on Raw the Fight Within podcast. Thank you very much to O'Hara Davies. Again, best of luck on December 2nd. And make sure you comment, like and subscribe. We are out.